Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 10J of Useful Genetics, where we're talking about again about the consequences of chromosome rearrangements, this time about their consequences for meiosis and gamete production and for gene function. We'll talk about the how rearranged chromosomes can pair or not pair in meiosis and the consequences for fertility. And then we'll talk about the novel joints, the new DNA sequence combinations that are created at the points where, DNA, where chromosomes are broken and rejoined incorrectly, and their consequences for gene function and for cancer. So the consequences of chromosome rearrangements for meiosis and fertility can be quite severe. Um, many people who are perfectly healthy discover that they're infertile because it turns out they carry a chromosome rearrangement. For example, consider this translocation shown in the first panel of this very complicated figure. Um, here's the normal chromosome arrangement. Here's a rearrangement where parts of the first chromosome have been, a part of the first chromosome is on the second chromosome, and a part of the second chromosome is on the first chromosome. This, these two chromosomes, I'll mark them with dots, are translocation chromosomes, but the person, provided the breakpoint didn't mess up any particular genes, the person who has this combination is perfectly normal. They've got all the genes they need in all the right combinations. But when their cells go to undergo meiosis, there's a big problem because None of their four chromosomes has a perfect homolog that they can pair with. Instead, if they each chromosome finds these homologous sequences to pair with, you end up with a nightmarishly complicated arrangement like this. The situation's even worse if the person carries a inversion. You can see all kinds of nasty complications here. These pictures are taken from genetics textbooks, and it's long been a pleasure of genetics professors to ask genetic students to explain exactly what is going on, what are the consequences for meiosis, what are the consequences for the gametes, what are the consequences if there's a crossover, for instance, here. Now, I'm not going to ask you to be able to analyze situations like this, but you do need to be aware that having chromosomes that will not pair normally can often cause infertility, either because the chromosomes get into terrible tangles and break and wind up with the acentric fragments that don't have centromeres and other fragments that have two centromeres, or um, the gametes simply wind up, wind up with incorrect numbers of chromosomes, as happened with aneuploidies. But you won't need to be able to analyze the actual events in meiosis for these combinations. The second topic I want to consider is the consequences of the novel joints that rearrangements create. Whenever DNA sequences are broken and then rejoined into new combinations, rejoined to new partners, the place at which that joining happens puts together sequences that are not normally together, and those are called novel joints. So, for example, here's a deletion chromosome where this segment from D to I has been removed, and the consequence is that the sequences at C are now right up against the sequences from J, which they weren't before. This is a novel joint. Similarly, with the duplication, again we have a novel joint, this time between these sequences and these sequences. Um, we can also have novel joints created by inversions where sequences that um, are now pointing in the opposite direction are joined in novel ways. And of course we can have novel joints caused by translocations that bring together sequences that used to be on independent chromosomes. The effect of creating these novel joints depends mainly on whether or not there's a gene there. If the breaks are not in genes, which is the case for most of the chromosome, there's usually no local problem. There may be other problems with, for instance, meiosis, but 
gene function is normally preserved. However, if the break occurs in a gene, or if one of the breaks occurs in a gene, then there are immediate local consequences of the novel joint. The first possibility is that the break causes part of a gene here to be joined to sequences that aren't gene sequences at all. And usually, this is going to create a non-functional gene fragment in the chromosome. So that gene will be a loss of function mutation. Um, however, parts of a gene could be joined to parts of another gene. I've drawn them here in the opposite orientation. So now neither gene has its promoter, and both would need to be transcribed in opposite directions. Or here, where I've drawn them, where in fact both genes might still have their promoters, but they don't have their terminators or their stop codons anymore. And the RNA polymerases and the ribosomes are going to, the RNA polymerases are going to collide coming from different directions. The most inter, again, this is likely to be a non-functional combination. The most interesting combinations um, that have consequences both for human health and for long-term evolution are novel joints that join part of one gene to part of another gene. Here, the promoter of one gene is intact, and the terminator of the other gene is intact. So we have potentially a new hybrid functioning gene. Now, I'm going to show you one example of such a gene. It's very important in cancer. But first, I'll remind you about um, something we know about tumor cells. Um, you've seen this slide lots of times now. But you'll remember that when we first brought it up, back in module four, we talked about how genetically diverse all the metastases and different parts of the tumor were, and in particular, how there were abundant chromosome rearrangements in essentially all of the cells that the researchers looked at. Um, the other part of this figure is from a different research study that was looking at, you'll remember when I introduced this earlier in this module, it was looking at evidence for tetramerization as an initiating step in cancer because many of the chromosomes in both these two different tumor types were found to have four copies, to be present in four copies. So these chromosomes were not picked out as an example of chromosome rearrangements, but here I've blown them up so you can see how many chromosome rearrangements there are, even just cells that were picked out for some other feature. So here you can see the different colors represent the chromosome of origin of the sequences. So here you can see two translocated sequences on versions of chromosome 1, blue sequences here, yellow sequences here, purple and green, two different translocations on chromosome 11, translocations on chromosome 12. And if we look at the other tumor that the researchers looked at, it's, it's ridiculous. So here's chromosome 1. It's got a whole lot of different combinations. Chromosome 11 is all striped. Even tiny little chromosome 21 has got pieces of at least three different... Chromosome 22 has got pieces of at least three different chromosomes making up it up now. So one particular example, most of those rearrangements will have been things that happened after the cell began to behave like a tumor. But there's one particular kind of a rearrangement where the novel joint is thought to be the actual initiating step in the cancer. And that's a kind of blood cancer called chronic myeloid leukemias. It's quite a common cancer. And it was found that almost everybody who has this cancer has a particular chromosome rearrangement that's called the Philadelphia chromosome because it was discovered by researchers in Philadelphia. What this translocation does is it breaks chromosome 9 near its tip by a gene called ABL, and it joins it to sequences from one end of chromosome 22 near a gene, in a gene, called BCR. And this creates one long chromosome, chromosome 9 with a big chunk of chromosome 22, and then one itty-bitty chromosome with 
the tip of chromosome 9, and the short arm and centromere of chromosome 22. When we look in detail at this chromosome, we begin to understand how this particular novel joint here, where the red sequences are fused to the green sequences, is actually the initiating step in forming the leukemia cells. Here's a close-up of the um, two genes. Here's the intact BCR gene with its introns and exons. Here's Abel. And here's the fusion gene with the five prime end of the gene is Abel sequences, and then the rest of the gene is BCL sequences. Here's the RNA, and here's the protein. Now, the next slide is a schematic of the conse functional consequences of this fusion. And unfortunately, the researchers, these researchers, didn't use the same color scheme as the previous slide did. So I sketched it in here. This is the equivalent to the red part, the BCR sequences. This is the green ABLE sequences. So you might wonder, well, what do these genes do? Well, the original intact ABLE gene activates cell cycle genes, so it stimulates cell division. It was quite hard. Nobody apparently knows exactly what it is that the normal BCR gene does. But this schematic shows what the hybrid protein has, the different kinds of function carried by different parts of the hybrid protein. So part of the BCR segment of the protein enhances proliferation. It increases cell division as well as ABLE does. Um, another part of the ABLE protein reduces adherence. It makes cells less likely to stick together and better able to disperse through the body. And the other part inhibits a process called apoptosis, which is a programmed cell death which is an important way that cells are told to stop growing. So these cells don't know to stop growing, and they're more likely to reproduce, and that's why they function so well as cancer cells. So we've examined the consequences of rearrangements for the ability to produce functional gametes, and very often rearrangements mean you cannot produce functional gametes. And we've considered how the novel joints that are created where chromosomes break and join to new partners can disrupt protein coding or they can create hybrid genes with new effects. And we've seen one particular example of this, the Philadelphia chromosome that causes cancer, causes leukemia in particular. Coming up next, we're going to think about smaller changes in chromosomes, the kind of changes that are sometimes called structural variation by DNA sequencers. I hope to see you there.